Okay, and then, then. Good afternoon. Could I please ask you to take your seats? And with this, uh, I would like to warmly welcome you, uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, uh, ISIS friends and, and family to this 2015 annual science uh, conference. During this annual science conference, we are showcasing ISIS as, a, uh, as our role as a knowledge provider, uh, and we are working towards our mission to advance the science understanding of marine ecosystems and ensuring that this knowledge is used as an input to how we are managing human activities that are impacting on the marine ecosystems. The annual science conference is an excellent opportunity to cover and promote areas and issues that we have in our ISIS strategic plan and also to showcase how we are working across science, advice, and data pillars in order to do this. As was shown so excellently during this morning's open uh, sessions, uh, where we had highlights from science and advice, and where we were looking into bridging the gaps uh, between the, uh, those that are collecting uh, the data and those that are using the data. And we, during this annual science conference, have 19 different theme sessions and a variety of different uh, social and site events where we will be looking into these issues. It is, as you know, also an excellent opportunity for all of us to network, to speak together with uh, other scientists, industry representatives and managers uh, about the current, but definitely also the future needs that we have for marine research. Uh, and with this, I will give the floor to the president, uh, Paul Connolly, who will address you in an opening remark. Thank you. It's a great privilege. Is this on? Can you hear me? It's a great privilege for me to welcome you to the ICES science conference, and I'm going to say four things, four very quick comments. It's a family gathering in our hometown of Copenhagen, and I particularly want to welcome all the new people uh, who, this is their first annual science conference, because it's the young new people coming into ICES that are really important for the future. This is a very powerful image for me, and it's one I've always liked about ICES, because it really gives the message about the network, the ICES network across the North Atlantic. The 4,000 scientists from 350 marine institutes in our 20 member countries and beyond. All of that network, 600 are gathered, more than 600, to focus on one or more of the key elements of the work of ICES. Producing the information and advice decision makers need underpinning science and advice through data and information services, and supporting the organization through the work of the Secretariat. There's a lot of business meetings go on in ICES behind the scenes, behind the science, and they are so important to ICES, and it's so important that so many of the people are here, and that's what makes the ASC so important to ICES. We are now well into the second year of our strategic plan. The Council, which is the member countries of ICES, will review progress on the strategic plan in October. And it's very good to see all our team sessions around this week focused on some element of the strategic plan or an area of the strategic plan. Particularly the SICOM open sessions around integrated ecosystem assessment ecosystem processes and dynamics, climate change, biodiversity, all key elements to the IC strategic plan. The SICOM open session on what makes a good conference will provide really important input to the future of this conference. And it's really important if you have ideas, go there, let us hear your ideas. It's really important in shaping the future of the annual science conference. 
the Bureau, the Board of ICES, will also meet during the week. And this is kind of the hidden work of ICES. Um, it's like the, the, the swan swimming, but the legs going underneath. The Bureau will meet and discuss very important issues around ICES, around the organization. One of those issues is about strengthening and investing in the future of the science leadership. And we need a good and healthy open discussion this week to talk about that. Because that again is a really critical point to the future of ICES and the way it works. The third thing I'd like to talk to you about is, as we are in the wonderful city of Copenhagen, I've taken the privilege to uh, take some words from one of Copenhagen's most famous sons, Hans Christian Andersen. He wrote wonderful stories in simple and clear language, but they had very powerful messages. Think of the emperor's clothes, think of the ugly duckling. And I offer you lines from the teapot as food for thought as you go into the week. There was a proud teapot Proud of being made of porcelain, proud of its long spout and its broad handle. It had something in front of it and behind it. The spout was in front and the handle behind. And that is what it talked about. But it didn't mention its lid, for it was cracked and it was riveted and full of defects. And we don't talk about our defects. Other people do that. The final fourth point I would like to make in my opening remarks to you is I was talking to my daughter who has started university and she's trying to be cool and trendy as she's gone from the transition to school and university and she had her keep calm t-shirt on and she mentioned this to me keep calm and I said keep calm about what keep calm about anything you want just put the message there just keep calm about it so my message for all of us would be let us all keep calm, but let us all keep the IC's vision and the IC's mission at the center of everything we do. By all means, over the coming week, interact, discuss, listen, learn, network, and above all, enjoy, because it is a great festival of science advice and data. I wish you a productive and enjoyable week. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, and I think there is a lot of things to be shown off uh, within ISIS. We have long spouts and broad handles, and maybe we also at times have some cracks, uh, and definitely we don't want to hide those off, but uh, we want to see how we can fix them and adjust them uh, when needed. So now I would like to uh, give the floor to Henrik Stusko, who is the Permanent Secretary from the Environment and Food Ministry. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the opportunity to come here and open your annual conference where science and management can, can meet. Paul just mentioned Hans Christian Andersen, so uh, maybe I should start a long time ago. July the 22nd, 1902, the Danish Prime Minister welcomed delegates from Finland, from Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Russia, United Kingdom, and Denmark, in fact, here in Copenhagen, and the new International Council for Exploration of the Sea constitutionalized itself. In the preluding years, Walter Havik worked intensely to develop German fishery. But like many others at that time, he realized that in the long run, uh, there was a need for more research uh, as a prerequisite for further development. As president for the German fishery organization, he became one of the main advocates for more marine research. And he himself arranged a number of expeditions to the Baltic and to the North Sea, only to realize 
that a thorough in investigation of the seas exceeded the capacity of a single country and of a single man. Collaboration was needed. This realization also spread in the region, and in the constitutional meeting in Copenhagen, Herwig was elected as the first president of ISIS. Since then, ISIS has, uh, has improved marine research and helped developing fisheries in an expanding area. And the knowledge and counseling is now more sought than ever. In a few days, political leaders from all over the world, in fact, 193 countries, will meet in New York to sign the agreement on 17 new sustainable development goals. One of these goals are number 14, and it says that we have to conserve the sustainable use of the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development for oceans. The seas are the main resource for food and employment for millions of people around the world, not least in the de de developing countries. And as the population still is increasing, the demand and the daily consumption of fish, fish and food are too. This means more demand for the products of the sea, and thus, of course, also good and sustainable management of the marine resources. And I think here it's very important that this uh, sustainable management is uh, on the basis of precise and comprehensive data about fish stock and marine ecosystems. I think that history has a lot of examples of fish stocks that have been almost depleted by overfishing. Maintaining healthy and productive fish stocks and marine environment and ecosystems is needed to underpin a sustainable fishery. You, here in this room, acknowledge this in your work on the challenge of protecting and restoring the health and productivity of the oceans to support the sustainable management of the seas. Better knowledge on how different species interact with each other and the marine environment is key, and ISIS is at the forefront with this work. If a species, like cod, for example, is feeding another species, takes brat, how does this interconnectivity work? And how does the potential impact of the use of different fishing gear on the marine environment influence the fish stocks? This is very central to secure sustainable management. In Denmark, like ISIS and other countries, we promote this approach. We have recently united environmental and commercial expertise in one ministry, in the Ministry of Environment and Food of Denmark, recognizing that you cannot separate fishing and environmental interest. We have also for several years have a concentrated, uh, done a, a concentrated effort uh, and financial support in partnerships between scientists and fishermen to develop selective fishing techniques that optimizes each hole and spares the seabed and remaining marine life. In the end, everyone from green organizations and uh, fishery pursues the same goal, a vigorous and prosperous marine life with healthy and sustainable stock of fish. But this demands insight to the depth of our waters, insights which ISIS deliver. In the EU member states, we are obliged to achieve good environmental status of the seas to fulfill the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. ISIS guide us to obtain the necessary knowledge and the guidance uh, is also evident uh, in our work within uh, HELCOM and OSPA. In the future, we hope that ISIS will also be able to steer us in the right direction as we work on getting a better understanding of the Arctic marine environment. ISIS knowledge in this area will be invaluable. 
I think this shows uh, that ISIS is uh, acknowledged uh, all around. And I must say, uh, as new in this job, and as a former uh, permanent secretary in the Minister of Environment, I am new in fishery and fishery politics. But even though I'm new, I have very quickly understood that ISIS play a key role in this field. And I think that your reputation might be a very uh, valuable asset. I have in fact heard administrators calling a compilation of ISIS yearly advice the Bible. I think this says all, you can't get higher. And if anyone needs proof of the tr trustworthiness of ISIS, just watch each year how eager po uh, policy administrators in the field of fishery are about getting ISIS scientific advice on the fish stock. That is because ISIS advice is the foundation for any nego negotiation and setting of fish quotas in and among ISIS member countries. And I think it's very important that you and we and others take care that this trustworthiness is maintained continuously and is guarded from all sides. Stakeholders, governments and administrators must abstain from trying to influence data or guidance to reach political or economic goals. And the fishery and the fishing industry must keep up the good cooperation. Because there's no doubt, ISIS and the fishermen are depending on each other to achieve the best available data. The most reliable data is gathered at sea in a cooperation between biologists and fishermen. Missing or incomplete data means that quotas need to be more precautionary. The more comprehensive and precise data ISIS uh, can deliver, the more we can optimize the utilization uh, of the fish stocks without compromising sustainability. So keeping the independence and reliability of ISIS in mind gives us something very valuable in return. Precise and reliable data to release growth potential for fishermen, the whole fishing industry, without jeopardizing uh, sustainability. I think that ISIS has come a long way since the Constitution in 1902. So has our utilization of the sea and its produce producers, and the demand for food and fishery and development will only increase in the years to come. As we continue to improve our policies for sustainable management of the marine environment, we know we must go beyond single sector or, uh, or management of individu individual resources. We must work on the basis of a, the entire ecosystem. To do so, policymakers across Europe and indeed the world absolutely rely upon the scientific expertise of ISIS to guide us. ISIS makes seafood production and environmental protection go hand in hand. You are the vital bridge to gap between science and policy. The challenges, they are plentiful, and you probably had to discuss some of these challenges on this conference. And I think you're in a unique position to continue your efforts to provide us with data to fulfill our obligations internationally, regionally, and nationally. So with these words, I would like very much to say, first of all, thank you for your attention but also to wish you a very uh, fruitful conference, which hopefully will lead to new cooperation, new insights, and further development of the activities of ISIS. So I hope you'll have a real nice conference here in Copenhagen. Thank you. Thank you, Henrik Stutzko, and it was really good to hear. Uh, and I think that we will remember uh, that our advice is referred to as the Bible. Uh, and we will remember to, to keep up the, what you call the trustworthiness, uh, the legi legitimate and uh, the non-political uh, advice in order to give the best scientific uh, basis uh, for, for managers to, to take their decisions. We have now reached another um, very exciting moment uh, in the opening session. 
uh, we are going to uh, hear who is receiving our Outstanding uh, Achievement Award. Uh, and I will uh, let Pierre Puttiger, the chair of the awards committee, uh, reveal that for you. Thank you. Good afternoon. ICES has a recognition program uh, which is run by the awards committee, which I chair. And the idea of having a recognition program is to uh, cement the network by uh, uh, recognizing uh, excellence. And this year, the outstanding awards uh, is uh, um, for uh, Adrian Reinstop from uh, the Netherlands. Today, it is an outstanding achievement to catch fish in the North Sea. <laughs> but we are talking of beyond these type of achievements. Uh, the award recognizes um, sustained and outstanding performance in contributing to ICs, leadership skills, continued commitment to uh, helping advance ICs as a dynamic international institution and enriching community and achievements in science, management, policy, and mentoring. And uh, Adrian has been excellent in all of these topics, as we will see. Here we see uh, Adrian during his PhD defense in 1991. And many of you, he's very concentrated, as usual, and uh, making his point. Um, his thesis has been published as uh, um, this uh, blue book there here that uh, some or many of you uh, know and have been influenced by. It's about long-term effects of fishing in North Sea plates. Um, Adrian started his career at the Fisheries Institute in Netherlands, now known as Imaris, in the early 80s and uh, took a chief scientist position since uh, uh, 2003, and that must have been a particular year because he also took a, a chair position at university um, that year. Colleagues uh, uh, say of him, he never loses focus of science-related objectives above any personal issues. And uh, I think this is... Uh, uh, really uh, something that uh, can guide us. So he has an academic and uh, he's an academic and applied scientist in both ways. We see uh, Adrian here uh, in the garment of a respected professor uh, giving the, uh, I don't know what, the magic box of uh, knowledge to uh, a young uh, doctor. Uh, he, he's been involved in more than 20 PhD uh, works and many of his uh, former scientists, uh, former students, sorry, are now leading scientists within ICs. Some of his former students write, he has always been very supportive and this has made a real difference in my career progression. And from the implied side, we see Adrian talking to uh, a fisherman who survived the place box. And uh, um, I guess that uh, has been involved in many, many discussions, more uh, um, uh, sometimes di difficult. Um, colleagues write of him, he builds relationships with the people whose lives are affected by science and resulting management. His uh, um, focus is on flatfish ecology and population dynamics. But he's gone into studying this from a variety of perspectives. And he's also undertaken key works on oceanography, effects of climate change, behavior of fishes, fisheries-induced evolution, and uh, economic aspects of fisheries. He's also... Uh, developed the uh, Flatfish Symposium, who has uh, become a, a brand, and perhaps one of the reasons 
in addition to excellent science, is that they organized games during that conference, a life cycle game, as you can see here. Colleagues write of him, he is a central figure in European fisheries science. His activities in ICES are long-lasting. He has been involved in expert groups since the early 80s, and he still is a member of groups like WEVO, which means Fisheries-Induced Evolution, and WHIST, which is about history of fisheries. Beyond that, he's been, and all his papers, he's been very active in contributing to the annual science conference through more than 40 communication papers in 30 years, so that's more than one per year. Um, here we see a, f a photo of, uh, in the early 80s of the working group on ecosystem effects of fishing activities, where you see Adrian there in the background. But what I find fascinating here is that there are no computers. <laughs> so people really took the time to interact and talk to each other. Yeah. People write, colleagues write of him, he has had an active role at ICES where he has spread his enthusiasm to early career scientists and researcher alike. We're all a community. Here you see the colleague, the collaborator, the friend, um, in action by day and by night. The, the wine of glass helps. Pe colleagues write of him, he has a a steely determination to make his points with exceptional intellectual rigor. He is never happier than when he is engaged in a debate about evolution. A most engaging personality that, that brings out the best of those that work with him, humble and always ready to talk and help, generous in spirit. And even a woman colleague writes, he became my scientific hero. <laughs> so with all this, it's a real pleasure and honor, honor. Adrian, please come on stage. Thank and I will... You. This is your ICES award. And there are more presents there that you can uh, put in the bag. Yeah, okay. okay. I always get the complaint that I'm talking too much, so that's not something which I'm going to do now. Um, <laughs> what to say? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> it's of course a great honor to, uh, to receive this award. And um, I would like to thank all the many, many, many colleagues which I've been collaborating with uh, over the last, uh, well, more than 30 years. I mean, it has been a great pleasure. Um, and I, I remember that um, one of the old guys at that time, when I was a young guy, talking about the ISIS spirit. And this is something which I experienced myself. So in my words, I mean, the ISIS spirit is that you collaborate you're open to each other, you trust each other, you share your ideas without being afraid of that people run away with your ideas. I mean, that open, positive, forward-looking uh, collaboration, I think that's always what I have experienced in ISIS. And I feel, of course, it's very honorable to get a report, but I mean, a lot of the things which has been mentioned by Pierre is all part of collaborative work. So there are many, many, many people involved in all these activities. So they should feel rewarded as well for our shared contribution. And I hope that uh, we old guys are able to pass on this ISIS spirit to all the young people in the, uh, in the ISIS meetings. And um, well, I hope we can just keep the spirit alive and that we all can enjoy a very 
exciting, productive and enjoyable uh, ISIS Annual Science Conference this year. Okay, thank you all. Big congratulations, and that was really, you could feel the warmth coming down uh, to the stage uh, here. We have now reached the point where we will have a, our open lecture, uh, and uh, this will be Dr. Henrik Gislason, who will tell us about understanding of patterns in marine species uh, richness. And we're just dealing with a bit of technicalities and we'll be ready. Hello? Yeah, it's working now. So, I've really been looking forward to this, dear colleagues, dear friends. As we all know, uh, we are living in a time of change. A couple of days ago, I uh, heard in the news that NOAA just released its uh, estimate of the sea surface temperature in August 2015. It was the highest on record for 135 years. Okay, it was only 0.04 degrees above the uh, next highest estimate, but the next highest estimate was from July 2015. So we are living in times of change. We are also living in uh, times where the distribution of marine species are changing their location around the world. In 2012, a research vessel caught three bluefin tuna between Iceland and Greenland. And in 2014, uh, the, a, a, a group of fishermen caught 21 bluefin tuna in this area. They were after the mackerel, which is also moving northwards. So things are changing. Life, the distribution of life in the ocean, it's changing uh, position. When we study the data we already have collected, however, we see that there are strong patterns in the way biodiversity is distributed. The problem is we do not really know what generated these patterns and how they were maintained over millions of years. My guess is that this lack of knowledge will make it difficult for us to predict the future. So, well, Biodiversity, unfortunately, is high on the agenda at the moment, on the political agenda. It's the focus of the first Marine Strategy Framework direct, uh, Directive Descriptor of Good Environmental Status. It's uh, the 
on the, on the, in the background, of course, of the Convention of Biological Diversity and the 20 IT targets. And it's also behind the uh, Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the IPPES, which was established in 2012. The IPPS has it as a goal to strengthen the science policy interface for biodiversity and ecosystem sciences, and its role in providing biodiversity advice has been compared to that of the, climate, the, the panel on climate change, although its mandate is much wider. It also, in addition to doing assessments, has to deal with um, knowledge generation, with policy support, and with capacity building. The IPPS has recently agreed on a conceptual framework for evaluating the relationship between man and nature. And uh, this is uh, innovative in the sense that it embraces a lot more than the previous framework we've looked at. There are, of course, different scientific disciplines involved and diverse stakeholders, but also it accommodates different knowledge systems and ways of societal valuation. So allow me to um, um, show uh, the, or well, to summarize the, the importance of biodiversity with just a simple slide here, where you have species, for instance, well, uh, tree species here. They have functions in the system like planktivory or piscivory, and they, together, they provide benefits to us uh, in terms of nutrient recycling and fisheries yields. This is just a very simple um, description of the ecosystem goods and services upon which we depend. In addition, there's a, an intrinsic value to nature, nature's gifts, it's called in the IPPS framework, which tries to accommodate that in many cultures, um, nature has a value in itself. If you go to South America, if you go to Asia, if you go to uh, the Pacific, um, there are traditions and local customs and cultures um, which incorporate um, biodiversity and nature in its way of um, perceiving life. Um, as an example of this, well, actually, to illustrate this, I know of no better way than to show you this picture here. This is of a uh, war bonnet, a fish living in the Sea of Japan, and it won the photo contest 2015 of the University of Miami. It has been estimated that there is around uh, one million species in the world. However, about a third, between a third and two thirds of those are yet not described and named by us. In terms of groups that are well described, well, fish is perhaps the best described. There are about 18,500 species now which have been named. We still expect about 4,000 more to be named before um, uh, 2050, or by 2050. Fish is the most species group of vertebrates on our planet. Thanks to the availability of regular research surveys of databases such as FISBase and of uh, biodiversity repositories, we have, a good, not, we have relatively good knowledge of the distribution of the different fish species on Earth. We have, for instance, uh, here in our area, the uh, ISIS Troll Survey database, the DATRAS database, where you can get things like uh, this picture here of uh, um, the number of taxa recorded in the North Sea, the Baltic, and the Celtic region. This is from the new book by Hazen et al. Uh, of the new fish atlas, which is on display at this conference, just been published. What it shows is the number of taxa recorded after 20 holes. And this thing about 20 holes is important because you have to standardize this kind of data in order to compare them across large areas. What it shows is that the Baltic has the least number of taxa per 20 holes, then comes the North Sea, and then diversity or species richness increases as you go to the Celtic Sea. But there are exceptions, like uh, you have uh, the Porcupine Bank, which is below the Iris, and the uh, Celtic Seas, and you have the North, Northern Kattegat, 
where again you get more uh, taxa recorded um, than you do in the surroundings. I say taxa now, and that's because not all of the species in these surveys have been identified to the species levels. For some of them, we have to lump them together because we are not able to tell them apart, like uh, the sand eel species or the smaller gobies, etc. From, from this database, you can also get the change over time. And this is now standardized to what you would see, expect to see after 400 holes. And what you see uh, is, in fact, very positive. You see an increase in the number of taxa recorded in all three areas. Um, and if you try to subdivide that into species with northern and southern affiliation, you'll see that this happens both for those come of, of, of southern affiliation and those of northern affiliation. So it's really quite interesting. What generates this pattern is actually a little bit difficult to see, to, to say, because there could be improvements in the uh, identification of species, or there could be changes or improvements also in sampling practices involved. But this is the gold mine that we as uh, fishery scientists are, um, are, 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 are in possession of. <coughs> There's also surveys available from many other places around the North Atlantic. And together with uh, colleagues, I've been uh, involved in collating a number of these surveys. We now have in our data uh, base 30 surveys representing more than 50 depth strata. We have for each survey 10 to 30 years of data. And uh, what I'll show you are the results for the pelagic and demersal species, excluding those from the very deep, the basipelagic and the basidemersal, and those who are associated with reefs, because the soil surveys don't often fish in, uh, in, 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 in places where you where have a lot of rocks. The data consists of the average number of individuals per species and square kilometers swept, and the number of species in each stratum. And then we have uh, the average sea surface temperature and primary product from, from, from satellite data, and the maximum lengths of each of the species we've taken from, from fish base. The maximum lengths, why that? Well, we've done that because the maximum lengths is highly correlated with the asymptotic lengths, and this again is correlated to growth rate, size at maturity, reproductive output, natural mortality, and all the other stuff which makes a life history. Furthermore, it's readily available for fish, that is, from, from fish base, for instance. If we look at the richness from the surveys, and this is just an average of uh, the um, surveys, but subdivided into different temperature bands. You've got Mauritania and Guinea on the top, over 20.5 degrees centigrade. And in the bottom, you've got surveys from Bear Island, northern Norway, the Barents Sea, uh, northern Ireland, uh, Iceland, Greenland, and the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So what you see is a steady increase in the number of species as temperature increases. What you also see is quite a regular pattern of distribution over maximum sizes. So um, except for a, bump and, and for, for a bump here and there, it seems to be kind of a unimodal uh, distribution. If you try to do the same from the numbers caught and calculate that, standardize that to the number caught per square kilometer swept, you see this picture. I was surprised to see how much, how equal the different areas actually were in terms of the number of fish. Mind you, I mean, these are locked, locked axes, so uh, there might be more variation hidden in that, but still, I was surprised. There is some variation for the small ones, but uh, that can be explained by differences in the mesh size used in the cut end of the gear. You can then try to apply models to this. You can use a generalized additive model to try to summarize what you see in the data. Um, there are various uh, covariates like temperature, maximum length, sampling effort, etc. And there was also the dense, the the the, uh, the, the uh, number, of the catch period and effort, the number per square kilometer in 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 the data set. Um, now you see an increase in the richness 
When temperature increases, as we saw before, you see a regular pattern with maximum lengths. You see that sampling effort matter. So the more you sample, the more species you will get, but there's a kind of an asymptotic development. And you see depths. These patterns are really tight. The dotted lines are the 95% confidence limits of the uh, GAM. You can also see the effect of mesh size. And the message is that large meshes catches fewer small species. For the small groups, like the three to six centimeter species, when mesh sizes go up, richness go down. You don't see what's out there. It's also possible, well, it's possible to learn something maybe from the underlying processes. And various models have been um, used to model uh, species richness biodiversity. There's the neutral theory of biodiversity and biogeography, saying that the local richness you would expect, if you look at competitively equivalent species, should be determined by immigration to the local area and by random local extinction. There's the metabolic theory of ecology, which says that temperature rules the mutation rate and the generation time of the um, population. So you would expect diversity to increase with temperature um, because of that. Actually, the theory um, um, predicts that the relationship between temperature and species richness should be determined by a constant A, which should be between minus 0.6 and minus 0.7. So quite a strong prediction. And then you could also take a null model which contains no biology at all and say that species richness is simply a question of where you are on the globe, the depths, and the size of the species, without any kind of biological, mechanistic understanding of what goes on. Let me explain a little bit more about the neutral theory. Well, if you have a local community, in this case consisting of blue, yellow, red, and green fish, then if a fish dies, it's being replaced either by birth in the community from a randomly selected individual, in this case a red fish, or by immigration from outside, a black fish comes in. So there's a surrounding community with a mixture of species, each reproducing and generating an offspring, which could by chance enter uh, the local community through immigration. There's a probability of immigration into the local community. In the surrounding community, if, something, if, some, if, if, uh, if an individual dies, it's in the same way replaced by a random offspring from one, from one of the species out there. And in addition to that, there's a possibility of having speciation in this community. And what the neutral theory actually says is that, OK, if you just repeat this over and over, this process here, then you'll reach a stable state where the uh, average number of species in the local and the surrounding communities have uh, stabilized, and that's your estimate of the diversity out there. So everyone in the local community has a chance of replacing a dead individual, and that's why it's called neutral, because there's, no, um, there's nothing in, in, in advance which can tell you what species it's, it is that will replace someone dying. The uh, metabolic theory on fecality, as I explained to you, uh, takes uh, temperature and say that the evolutionary rate per individual is determined by temperature, while the total number of individuals out there has something to do with the productivity of the area. And then it combines the two to say that the overall speciation rate must be a function of both the uh, evolutionary rate per individual and the total number of individuals. However, species also go extinct over time. And the uh, extinction rate is a question of how many, uh, how many um, uh, individuals you got per species. If you only got few individuals per species, then the chance that somebody will disappear increases. Together, speciation and extinction provides the species richness you observe. But the prediction of the model is that uh, this constant A, you will see 
if you go from one community to another, from low temperature to high temperature, then the constant should be minus 0.6 to minus 0.7. Let's try to look how these uh, different models work with the data from the northern Atlantic. The neutral, here you got the number of species observed on the x-axis and up you got the predicted number of species. And what you see is that uh, the proportion of what is called the deviance, that's the proportion of the variation in the data, popularly, as I, well, in, in, in other words, uh, that goes from 83% for both the neutral and the metabolic uh, down to, say, 80% for the one with latitude. So actually, uh, there's very little to tell you which version of evolution is correct. The problem with a lot of these types of analysis is that it's so difficult to learn the process just to tear the process out of the pattern. So what can we do? Well, there is also now data available on the uh, global scale. You can, from fish base, get the number of species in different areas, and this is uh, fish species richness by large marine ecosystems. You can see they have different colors according to the number of species they contain. The uh, East China Sea is uh, the, uh, the most species, and then you have systems containing less species as you go to the north or the very south. If you plot them as before, in the same way, sort them into maximum size groups, and then plot the number of species per large marine ecosystem, grouping them into temperature intervals, again you'll see that the highest temperatures have the LMEs with the most species. And you see, again, a regular pattern um, with the intermediate size groups being more, uh, containing more species than uh, the larger and the smaller. A really regular pattern, except that it seems to be changing slightly towards smaller species in the warmest areas. It's easier to see if you just look at the relative number of species instead. So produce curves which sum up to 100% and look at this percentage composition across the different systems. A regular pattern, but a change towards uh, smaller species. And if you look at the right side limp of this, you'll see that there say, seems to be a change in how the number of species increase, increase up to the maximum. How to interpret these data? Well, we do not have the abundance data as we had from the troll survey, so we have to come up with something else. And what you could do is to uh, use the very regular size spectrum you often observe, or you very often observe actually in marine systems. If you plot the density of, of, the, um, of, of, of individuals against their um, body mass, you'll see that uh, they often, on a lock lock plot like this, fall on a straight line all the way down to the phytoplankton and all the way up, there seems to be kind of a straight line operating. That's actually a really a persistent picture or pattern you observe, you can observe in the sea. Now, that size spectrum is generated by, uh, by um, a di different species growing from f fish, for instance, growing from fish larvae up to adults. The formula here is just to describing what you see. It's, uh, a power function where there's a power lambda, which is actually the slope of the spectrum. Anderson and Bayer in 2006 um, made a very useful discovery where they found out, well, we can also model this size spectrum by lumping the different species together. Instead of looking just at body mass, we can look at how much the species of different size contribute to the spectrum. How do they have to be uh, adjusted in order to produce this straight line you saw before? So here you can see species, a yellow, a green, blue, and a red fish. 
mean growing to, towards their asymptotic size, their maximum size. And together, the numbers will produce a straight line um, produce, uh, indicated by the uh, formula. Now, in order for this to happen, in order for the straight line to be produced, then the abundance of each of the species must obey a certain law. And Anderson and Bayer was able to show that there was another power function involved, this time with asymptotic size. So there was a beta, which told you how uh, the number of individuals would change with asymptotic size. An asymptotic size spectrum, so to speak. And they showed also that the log of the number of individuals in asymptotic weight bin should be a linear function of log asymptotic weight. That is, that the slope of this uh, asymptotic size spectrum should be minus 0.5. The beta should be minus 0.5. This, again, is a strong prediction. But we can derive abundance from this model and use together with the data on the number of species observed. So, the idea was, um, was uh, um, um, the, 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 the idea, uh, Royman got the idea in 2014 that you can use this size spectrum to derive the number of individual and asymptotic size intervals. Once you knew the numbers in these size intervals and you assumed that they were competitively equivalent, you could use the neutral model to calculate what should the number of species then be. So combining, us, combining these things, you got what was, would be the size spectrum. How many species do we have in each asymptotic size interval? And that should, again, be a straight line. So they made a model with three ingredients. A size spectrum model to produce the numbers out there in each asymptotic size interval, so many large species, individuals for large species, so many individuals for small species. And uh, then uh, they combined that with a neutral model in each of these groups to say how many species would that be. Uh, and a model of migration, immigration to shift the species around according to their asymptotic size, areas, temperature, and the rate of, of migration. The predictions out of the, from the model was that, the, yes, the number of species should also decline with size, with a slope of minus 0.5, but it should change. If you look at different large marine ecosystems, the, uh, it should change between the minus 0.5, which was the global estimate, and minus 0.15. It should be shallower, less steep, in warmer and smaller LMEs than in larger and cold. LMEs. Now, if you take the fish-based data, the number of species you find at, of different size, and do the, plot, uh, do the plot, then at least in the size range from 1 to 1,000 kilogram, um, you should have uh, the spectrum dominated by fish. So this was the size range used. These were the diversity spectrum slopes they observed. And this here is the spectrum you got out of those data. So, it wasn't minus 0.5, it was minus 0.56. But, I mean, what a nice pattern to be able, just from the, uh, the observed number of species in different LMEs to predict the, that the, how they should be ordered on, if you plotted them against the maximum weight of the species. And nature had such a pattern that a slope of minus 0.5, which was a purely theoretical construct initially, would actually come out of the data on the global scale. Also, the model predictions of less steep slopes in warmer and, uh, and, la and large areas, uh, and, and so, sorry, smaller areas were confirmed. The problem is, however, and that was also the problem with the model, you couldn't predict how many species there should be in each different area. You, should, you could only predict the relative size composition and how that would change across the globe. And that's really the main mystery still. 
We know there's a latitudinal gradient in biodiversity, so that biodiversity will, will grow from the poles towards equator. We can see that both if you talk about genetic diversity, if you talked about species diversity, and also in terms of community diversity, it increases. The, um, <coughs> this pattern has been known for 300 years. It has occupied some of the foremost ecologists, biologists, and scientists in this area, and a lot of proposals have come up. It's not been explained satisfactorily yet. There's no satisfying, fully satisfying explanation of it. <clears throat> you can see it here in marine bivalve richness. The blue, no, blue areas are where you have few species by one by one. <laughs> um, 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 by one by one, uh, latitude, longitude, degree. And the red areas are where you have the many. And you can see it if you go look across taxa, like uh, Titten saw it all did in their 2010 paper. You can see that uh, if you take all the taxa and then look at the distribution across the globe, and that's what you do in the upper um, picture, then uh, you can see the red areas are in the hot zones. And the sea surface temperature below, if you plot the two against each other, you can see a regular pattern with sea surface temperature. And mind you, this was certain very different groups. It was euphorsids, it was foraminifera, it was uh, macrophytes, it was, uh, well, the exception actually was pinnipeds. And you can probably also mention penguins as an exception to this. But for all the other taxa, and surprisingly, this pattern is also the same on land. So this is one of the few large-scale patterns that is shared by both, its, both the terrestrial and the aquatic environment. It's really a pity. We do not know why. <laughs> mm. Yeah. There are 32 hypotheses in total to explain the pattern. I won't go in depth with many of these. <laughs> we have already talked about the metabolic theory and the neutral theory. They can, you can group them into uh, three kind of overall groups, like those dealing with ecology, those dealing with the environment, and those dealing with history. And there's, of course, overlap. So just to mention a few, um, there are those, especially in terrestrial ecology, who think that it's the primary production which determines the, um, the number of species, because you see uh, high production in the tropics, and when you go to the poles, towards the poles, the um, production goes down. Mm -hmm. There's those who say that, well, for most of evolutionary history, the Earth has been much hotter than it is now. So uh, many animals would be adapted, I mean, many plants would be adapted to this, so there's some kind of conservatism in the niches they have. There are those who say that it's, well, if you take an area and double it, then you'll see more species. So maybe it's because the tropic area is uh, much larger than the area you find at high and low latitudes. And there's those who think that it could be the environmental stability, um, that you have seasonality when you go to the temperate zone, but more constant, a uh, more constant environment in the tropics, that could be the, um, the reason. And then there are those who say that uh, it's the, the history of the, uh, the, the oceans and the, the world <laughs> in terms of how environmental uh, change and also, of course, tectonic processes have shaped the, 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 the distribution of, of uh, species numbers over time. I've talked about uh, ecology and environment, I think temperature and um, species into competition and interactions. Um, let's look at uh, history. So if you are, look at the North Sea, our area, and start um, year zero, that's now, and then you go backwards in time, 4,000 years, 5,000 years, and what happens? The sea retracts 
and uh, you see the ice sheet spreading. This is now, we're back at the maximum uh, glaciation as we had, where uh, the most, most of Europe was, was covered, or northern Europe was covered by ice sheets. And you can see that the sea has subtracted or, or retracted to almost the edge of the continental shelf. At that time, because most of the water were lying on top of the poles, uh, the water level in the sea was 130 meters below the present level. And the uh, area of uh, continental shelf available to benzos and demersal fish were only a quarter of what it is today. Now, 22,000 years, that's not so long ago. We have had uh, We've had 49 glaciation periods over the last 2.6 million years. 40 periods, 49 periods where uh, the uh, shelf areas have been reduced, and a lot of other things have happened. Remember, a lot of the primary production is taking place on the shelves. A lot of the tiny the tidal energy in the ocean is dissipated on the shelves. So this has meant a major change in the living condition of what was out there. And the marginal seas were really hard hit. Look here, the Baltic. Well, the, when the ice retracted, it left an ice lake behind. Uh, the ice lake had its outlet through Öresund, which is just out here. So Öresund was a river. And the reason that the Öresund is deep is, was, is because of the current going out from the Baltic, the melting ice. Then uh, the ice retracted further. And because of the weight of the ice, the southern part of Sweden was um, 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 depressed and had yet not rebounded after the weight of the ice had lifted. So uh, there was a passage across southern Sweden, and salt water came in, and you had the Yoldia Sea, named after a marine species found there. Then again, the ice uh, so it retracted further, and the land slowly um, increased in height, rebounded. And uh, the Baltic, because the uh, level in the ocean was still low, the Baltic uh, increased its size. There was now an outlet uh, over the large Swedish lakes. But this was, uh, again, a freshwater lake. And then came the period 6,500 years ago when we had the so-called Litsurina Sea, where the Baltic was more salty than it is today. You can go to the Black Sea. 8,000 years ago, it was a lake. And then water level in the ocean rose, and in came salt water about 8,400 years before present. You can see the first traces of the salt water. And water levels increased, and the Black Sea um, increased its area also quite dramatically. I mind you, the Mediterranean, five million years ago, it was almost completely dry. What it was called the Mycenaean salinity crisis um, had evaporated most of the water. A lot of the water in the ocean were lying, or were, 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 could, wasn't able to get in through the Strait of Gibraltar because land has, has because of the uh, African and, 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 and the, uh, and, and because African was, Africa was moving towards uh, Europe, um, the, the Strait of Gibraltar was closed at that time, and water um, was almost completely um, taken out of the, uh, of, of the um, almost completely disappeared from, from the uh, uh, Mediterranean, leaving. Some say a practice lake, some practice lakes, others say freshwater environments, depending on where you are. You see the remnants of that in, in, in large salinity, uh, saline uh, deposits on the bottom of the, of, of the, uh, of, of the sea. And, yeah. So, what has marine science to offer in this perspective? Well, most fossils are of marine origin. We have good records of uh, paleo temperatures from sediment cores, and we have good possibilities for reconstructing past ocean circulation from uh, amp simulation models. 
We have also comparatively undisturbed ecosystems, and that particularly would go for the deep sea, below 3,000 meters, where we also have much more stable temperature conditions. Um, do we find the latitudinal gradient there? We don't know. It seems to be weaker from the few samples available, but we really don't know much about this environment. Not enough yet. We have the standardized survey data, um, where we both got the number of species and their abundance, relative abundance. And then we got models like the size-based and trait-based models that we can use to predict or hindcast abundance at size. So I think that we are pretty well prepared to digest or understand the past. We're much better um, then we're much, we have much better possibilities for understanding the past than we have for predicting the future at the moment, I guess. So my conclusions are that there are strong patterns in how marine species richness is distributed spatially, temporally, and by size. We cannot easily derive the processes from the patterns. And to understand them, we need to integrate knowledge from paleontology, from phylogeography, from paleoceanography, biogeography, and ecology. So we have to bring a new crowd of people together to do this. Fisheries ecology have a number of advantages because of the quantity and quality of the data available. We have scientific surveys, we have estimates of relative density, and we have uh, taxonomic completeness almost when it goes, when at least as it comes for, for, at least as, as, as it is for, well, for, for the fish species we, have, we, are, we are observing. We are heading for a period of rapid change due to global warming and ocean acidification. So uh, to understand how biodiversity will change, I think that we need a better understanding of how richness patterns were generated in the past, because if we don't know how they were generated, I think it will dif be difficult for us to predict the future. So ISIS, I think, the oldest and most experienced organization promoting cross-disciplinary marine science has a great opportunity here. To support advances in this area, ISIS could bring these different disciplines in contact with each other and generate uh, um, an environment where the necessary data for studying these, um, the, the past in the northeastern, northeastern Atlantic could be promoted. With the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services and the widespread policy commitment to protect and preserve marine biodiversity in a changing climate, the need for advice is likely to rapidly increase. Understanding how the past has generated the present patterns in marine biodiversity will help us how to understand how they will change the future. Thank you. Yes, let's give a hand. Many thanks to uh, Henrik Jislason, not least for making such a complicated uh, seem uh, to present it in such an understandable way uh, for all of us, but also uh, for saying, for pointing to how uh, important it is that we are working across uh, disciplines uh, and how important it is for us that we are understanding the past in order for us to be able actually to predict the future. And I think we all listen to now some suggestions for how ISIS could take up uh, some new areas and some new themes uh, and that we could also then uh, be available to give advice uh, as to uh, the future of the biodiversity. And to all of you, I would like to say that uh, this lecture has been live streamed uh, and it will be uploaded uh, on our uh, YouTube channel and you will be able to have a look on it uh, later on. And that will be the same also uh, with the two other plenary lectures that we have, we'll have a little bit later uh, during this week. And of course, you will be able to go into our website and you will be able to find the link there. 
Um, now, we are soon about to be there to go out to the uh, exciting uh, theme sessions and all the discussions that we are having. We have been talking a lot about Bibles during this session, and I want to show you another uh, version. This is a small Bible, and with this in your hand, you are actually going to be able to navigate yourself through all the theme sessions and all the side events and social events uh, that are happening. In ISIS, even though we have 100 years um, of knowledge and experience, we don't like to do things the uh, uh, same way as we did last year. Uh, so be aware that there will be no uh, welcome reception tonight, as is usually the case, but that we will have tomorrow. And you also have to have a close look into your conference back, because in that conference back you will find uh, the invitation. And if you don't bring that invitation, they won't let you in at the Copenhagen Town Hall. And there's also another thing that you have to remember, that when it says 1900 on the invitation, it means 1900 sharp. <laughs> now, when it comes to the... Uh, side events, uh, besides the 19 theme sessions that you will be able to choose around, choose among. Uh, they are both those that we usually have, but they are also some newcomers. So do look out. Uh, look out for the project marketplace that we will have on Wednesday afternoon, close to the evening. Uh, go to that and hear about ISIS involvement in projects and maybe get some uh, good ideas. We will also have a high-level representative from DG Research and Innovation who will engage with us in a, in a panel discussion. And of course, don't uh, forget the poster session, which will be back-to-back uh, -back with this uh, project marketplace. Um, now I can see that somebody has already nicely put on a, a slide for me here because what is an annual uh, science conference without sponsors? And I would like already now to bring a big thank you to the sponsors who had, has made it possible for us to arrange this uh, uh, conference here in, in Copenhagen. So if I, I think that somebody, yes. <laughs> so I would just do... With this, uh, I want to uh, also encourage you to network, to participate, to contribute, to share and enjoy, and maybe even to do that by using our uh, Twitter hashtags. So welcome. Uh, the uh, 2015 Annual Science Conference is now about to begin. <laughs>